to tell you a little bit about our organization and then I'll introduce our speaker, Laura Craver Rogers, to you. Um, Friends of Sears Island is the land manager for the 600 acre conservation area on Sears Island in Searsport. And we maintain public accessibility and act as stewards of the land there. We offer a wide array of educational programs to the public as well. Um, so normally we would be offering in-person natural history walks and giving and doing evening talks like this at the Belfast Free Library. Um, but we've had to change it up a bit this year and we're continuing our educational programming through Zoom presentations like this one tonight. Um, and by putting together take and learn activity kits for uh, local families each month. Um, Sears Island does continue to be open uh, for exploring in all seasons though. And we've had a wide variety of mammals that have been spotted on the island over the years. And this summer we had reports of many wildlife sightings, including fishers, large coyotes, deer, and even a whale right in the bay between Sears Island and Mack Point. Um, so that kind of got us thinking it would be fun to do um, a program on mammals like we're doing this evening. So if you do plan to visit the island soon, I also encourage you to check out our brand new interpretive signs that we just installed um, near the entrance to the island um, just a couple weeks ago. And we're really pleased with how those turned out. Uh, we hope that this program will inspire you to get out and explore and observe in nature this winter, whether that be on Sears Island or another local preserve or in your own backyard. And if you're interested in learning more about all the good work that our group is doing, you can visit our website or Facebook page. And if you find value in our programming, we encourage you to consider becoming a member. Um, our organization relies heavily on donations and grants to carry out our mission and to continue to offer free public programming. So now I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Laura Claver Rogers is the Education and Outreach Supervisor for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. She works with many of the IFNW staff to create, plan, and promote educational programs about Maine's wildlife and wild places, including several virtual wildlife talks from the Maine Wildlife Park. And Laura has been an educator and presenter for over 10 years and has a background in wildlife biology, ecology, environmental education, and interpretation. So thank you, Laura, for taking time to be here tonight um, and to give this presentation, and we'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a, a pleasure to be here and um, to be presenting to all of you. Uh, Belfast is a place that I have been many times. So I'm, I'm happy to um, be a part of this um, community um, and organization. And I've, I've been to Sears Island and it is a, a wonderful place to visit. So I highly recommend it if you haven't been there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now and share my screen so you can go ahead and see the presentation now. Um, and we're going to be talking about the seasonal habits of Maine's mammals. Um, and we're specifically going to be focusing on the Maine's mammals of the mid coast region. So obviously Maine is a pretty big state and there's a lot of different places that you can see wildlife. But um, today we're going to focus on the species which will be seen, you know, around Belfast area, Sears Island, of course. And, um, you know, if you have questions at the end, you know, put them in, put them in the chat and um, we'll get to them at the end. But here's just a couple shots of some habitats that, you know, you probably are very familiar with, you know, forests and fields, coastal spaces. Um, these are all different kinds of scenes that you could see going hiking around here. And these are kind of habitats we're going to be mostly talking about tonight. If you haven't been to uh, Sears Island before, I thought I'd throw this in here. Um, it's a wonderful place to go hiking, a wonderful coastal preserve, and coastal habitats are, of course, very important um, for wildlife. Um, lots of people like to live along the water, and a lot of wildlife also like to be um, along waterways. You know, Maine has a lot of rivers and lakes and ponds and um, coastal uh, shoreline also. So um, just a little place to check out and to learn more. You could go to um, Friends of Sears Island, uh, org, uh, to learn more. So today we're going to be talking about um, different kinds of animals. And there's a lot of different ways that we can talk about Maine's wildlife. And one of the ways we can talk about Maine's wildlife is, is by habitat choice, right? Uh, very often we say things like, oh, things like forest habitat and field habitat and wetlands. But really, those are just definitions of our different types of vegetation. Animals often, their habitat could be a forest and a field and, and even wetland. They often live across many different types of uh, plants. 
and vegetation and um, they meet their needs. You know, the animals in their habitat, they can find food, they can find shelter, um, they can find water and space. So that's one of the ways we can talk about how, how wildlife kind of interacts with um, the, their, their area. And things to think about when we're looking at different land around us, how, how other animals besides humans will use the land. So a couple different animals that live in each of these as well. Um, and this is just to show us that they use more than one type of habitat, right? We're all familiar with moose, we're here in Maine, but moose are one of the fun ones I like to point out because a lot of people think of them as living in wetlands, right? But that's just their summer choice because there's food that's high in sodium, lots of vegetation to eat there, but they also really like to move into forests and, and new growth areas, especially in the winter where they can go and they can eat the young saplings and branches and things. You might find them going across fields because it's an easy place to walk across, right? Even moose don't want a difficult walk if they can help it. So a lot of different ways animals use habitats. We also find that animals eat in all different ways, right? We've all heard of these words before. Maybe some of us, it's, it's been a little longer than others, but we often learn about animals by the type of diet they eat. Are they an herbivore and they just eat plants? Are they a carnivore? like? like a bat and they're eating insects and other animals? Or are they an omnivore like a raccoon and they're going around eating anything from different types of small insects, sometimes small animals, berries, mushrooms, right? Are nice friendly little omnivores. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go ahead and describe animals. We also have, how do they survive in the winter, right? Do they migrate like different bats and bird species? Do they hibernate like, well, other bats <laughs> or groundhogs and you know even our bear we like to say hibernate even though they will wake up sometimes those bears in the winter time um, or do they stay active like our foxes our coyotes our squirrels right there are a lot of different ways that we can talk about wildlife one of my favorite ways to talk about wildlife and kind of the main way we're going to focus on it tonight is food chains um, I think food chains just cover a lot of those things we just talked about, right? We're looking at what are animals eating? Who are they eating? And uh, it often determines their adaptation. You know, adaptations are determined by this to help them survive. So here's just a simple food chain I put together to remind us in case you haven't dealt with food chains or food webs lately. But if an animal eats a plant, they're an herbivore. And then those herbivores are often eaten by carnivores. So we have a little deer mouse there that could get eaten by a red fox. So that's the kind of way we're gonna take a look tonight at the different types of animals that stay um, out at Sears Island. We'll also talk a little bit about, are they migrating? Are they hibernating? Are they staying active? Because after all, it's December now. It is winter, right? We are coming into winter. We have the winter solstice in a few weeks. And so how could you not talk about what animals are doing to get ready for the winter time? So again, we have a red bat there for migrate. It's one of our migratory bats there. You can see in the upper left-hand picture. In the middle is the groundhog and groundhogs are one of our true hibernators here in Maine. They will go to sleep. And if you found one on a burrow, they would almost look dead. They're in such a deep, deep, deep rest. Then of course the red fox and the gray squirrel active all year round. So what causes these animals to all of a sudden be like, it is time to change my habits? Well, believe it or not, it's similar to what we do. When the sunlight changes, you probably start thinking, I want to eat chilies. I want to, you know, wear my cozy sweaters, right? We have our traditions. Animals are kind of the same way. When you start having a different light, you know, you got to get, you know, it's dark by four. <laughs> we realize this. We notice the change of light. And so animals notice these things too in the fall and it gets them to think it's time to get ready for winter. So some like the chipmunk will go ahead and they'll stuff their little cheeks of food and they'll hide it in their burrows. Others like bears um, and other animals that are going to be more out exposed and the elements are going to put on a lot of weight to get through the winter time. So the amount of daylight or what we call the photo period tells them it's time to change our habits to get ready for the winter. All right, I know you probably think squirrels. What is there to talk about squirrels? They are actually a very 
fun animal in the winter time. I'm sure many of you have watched squirrels steal the food out of your feeders. Um, you know, you've watched them, you know, you chew through your trash can, you store your seeds, right? We all have these issues. But the two squirrels that we're lucky enough to have here in Maine, well, actually we have three, but we won't get to the flying squirrel today, is the gray squirrel and the red squirrel. So you can see them both right there side by side. And they can very much overlap where they live. You can find them both out on Sears Island. Um, the gray squirrel there on the right is, um, prefers to live in I like the, more like the edge or open forests. Um, and in the winter time, they will, they will hide food. They will gladly enjoy your, uh, your bird feeder, as long as you feel like keeping it full. But they love to take food as they find it in the winter time and in, in the fall as well. And what they do is they take it and they put it in their cheeks and they run off with it and they hide it. Now we've all heard squirrels sometimes can't find their nuts again, right? They can't find them, they're burying them everywhere, right? That's what a gray squirrel does. They take those seeds, they take those nuts, they take those acorns, and they hide them all over the place. Tree crevices, holes in trees, um, they'll hide them underneath leaves and in bushes. And sometimes if another squirrel is watching them, they will hold the nut, they'll pretend to bury it, and then they'll run away someplace else because they don't want someone to know where they're caching, where they're stashing their food. But then there's the red squirrel. A little bit different tactic on the red squirrel's part. The red squirrel doesn't want to forget where they hide their food. So the red squirrel, although they're doing the same thing, gathering up all that food this time of year, they hide it generally in one spot. They might have a second cache um, somewhere nearby, but they hide it in one spot so they don't forget so they can find their food. But what's the problem in that? What if somebody finds your stash? That's it. You've lost most of your survival food. But for them, it works. And I'm sure a lot of us have been scolded by red squirrels, right? You guys have been walking around outside, maybe you get too close to one, and all they do is yell at you. They have this loud chatter, and they're scolding you. Now, if you were an eagle or a hawk, this would be a horrible way to scare away a predator. But when you go hiking and you hear this and they're chattering at you like that, they're very hyperactive, they're very aware of their surroundings, they consider you a threat. And by yelling at you because you're on the ground, you can't fly up and grab them, they don't care if you see them. They yell to try to scare you away and to warn everybody else around them. So it's a pretty good survival strategy. And both the gray and the red squirrel this time of year, you might notice they're the fur on the tops of their ears is getting a little longer it's to help keep them warm, right? Everyone gets a little bit thicker fur and their tail even gets a little bit more fur because sometimes they'll curl their tail over their head, kind of like this red squirrel is doing in this picture. And it helps to kind of act like a winter coat. It kind of covers them up when they're hunched over on the ground eating their food. So it's a pretty good survival strategy. Red squirrels are very hyperactive. You've probably seen that in movies sometimes, like what is it, over the hedge? It's a very hyperactive squirrel. Another member of the squirrel family is the chipmunk. Everyone thinks they hibernate, but they don't. They are active year round. The difference is they stay inside all winter. I'm sure there are plenty of us who would prefer to stay inside all winter. I like to get out and go do things, so I, that might not be my, my animal, but what they do is just like on the left, they stuff their cheeks with food. And a squirrel, I mean, a chipmunk actually has pockets inside those cheeks that it stuffs with food. So it's not in its mouth. It's in little skin pockets inside of its cheek. And it stuffs them full, and then it puts one in its mouth as well. And then it runs off, goes down into its burrow, which usually has more than one entrance for safety. And then it has within its burrow different rooms, right? Because you have rooms in your house. They do too. They actually have a pantry. I don't think they call it that, but they have a pantry and they put all their food in there. They actually might have more than one pantry if they're very good at uh, stashing their food. And they also have a sleeping room, a little bedroom. They also have a room where they go to the bathroom. No one wants to sleep and poop in the same space. <laughs> and then they even have a garbage room. Because when you're done eating all those shells, there's garbage. And if you leave that with your fresh food, your fresh food might 
rot. Now, this is a really great survival strategy. And you might think, yeah, especially this year, I want to <laughs> stash up all my food and stay inside all winter. There's one major threat that a chipmunk faces when it's getting ready for winter time. It's other chipmunks. Sometimes while a younger chipmunk is busy stashing away food for the winter, an older chipmunk will sometimes watch and when he sees the other chipmunk leave his burrow to go get more acorns or seeds or nuts, he'll sneak in and steal food and bring it to his burrow. So it's not just predators eating prey. Sometimes it's those herbivores kind of fighting each other for their food source. It's a big problem when you are a squirrel. However, if you are a squirrel, you also have another big problem, predators. We have some really cool predators here in Maine. Um, here we have some pictures of, on um, one side we have the red fox, and then we have the coyote. Both of these predators are canines, so they can smell really well. Canines can actually smell a picture of their world. Think of it that way. In their brain, they can make a picture out of smell. Um, they can, of course, see really well and hear really well, which will help them when they're hunting in the winter. Now, a chipmunk, as long as he stays asleep with enough food, he doesn't have to worry about this. He stays in his burrow, he wakes up, eats acorns, goes back to bed, never goes above ground. But those fat looking little gray squirrels that have just been stashing up all their food all winter and are still running around to get it, well, they've got to watch out for foxes and coyotes. Now, coyotes, they're about the size of like a big dog, like a big German shepherd like that, you know, a pretty large dog. And they will eat things like rabbits and squirrels, sometimes mice, and you know, they can even eat things up to the size of like deer sometimes. And um, they they got a nice thick fur coat in the winter time. And just like a lot of animals, they're putting on that extra layer, the same way, you know, you or I might wear a warmer coat in the winter time. And so you can see in that, that picture in the snow, that coyote has this beautiful fluffy tail as well. And that fluffy tail, it's going to use it to help one, it kind of provides a little bit of balance if it's digging around and stuff, a little protection for its back end. Um, but when it sleeps, it can curl up. I mean, I mean, some of us might have seen this with our cats or our dogs. When they sleep, when it's cold, they curl up and they, they put that tail kind of over their nose. And uh, it's like a little blanket. It's portable. It's always with you. Um, here you can actually see that action in the red fox there. Uh, right? You guys can see that red fox in the bottom picture. He's nice and curled up. It's probably a warm day because he's actually out in the open. Usually when they sleep, they sleep underneath um, maybe some low branches or shrubs. Um, they don't go in dens in the winter time. They only go in dens when they have their babies, like in the springtime. But they sleep curled up with that little uh, foxy tail over their nose and uh, they sleep. Now foxes don't often go in as thick a forest as a coyote. Um, they do go in forests, they are found in fields, um, but not quite as thick. And they tend to eat smaller animals because they're like about the size of like a small to medium dog. So they're mostly eating like rabbits and rodents and squirrels um, and things like that. So for our next animal, it's the deer mouse. We have a lot of really cool rodents here in Maine. I'm just gonna focus on the deer mouse tonight. Um, we also have all different moles and voles that also um, live at ground level. You might have found some of them in your house this time of year, trying to, trying to find shelter, stash away from in your house. Um, but here's a little deer mouse, also called a white-footed mouse. They're a typical mouse size, you know, from two to three inches in length. And they like to eat berries and seeds and plant material. And they like when winter comes for one reason they get a nice cover of snow and leaves. And that nice cover of leaves and then a nice layer of snow makes really good shelter for them. So as the leaves fall on the forest floor, you know, out around all of our favorite hiking trails or out in your yard, um, these animals start to make tunnels. And sometimes when the snow melts in the spring, you can kind of see the, the indentation of that tunnel going across the lawn and you can kind of make out their pathways. And as the snow gets deeper, it actually insulates the ground and protects any animals whose tunnels are under there warmer. And while they're there, um, in the fall, and that's what they're eating. And you would think they're fairly safe there, but a fox 
has a very good hearing. And you, you can look it up on YouTube if you want to see a, a video of this, but foxes will listen and tilt their head until they can figure out where under the snow that mouse is tunneling, and then they pounce through. They leap up in the air and feet, front feet first, go down with their face, and they try to catch, they try to break through all the layers of the snow so they can catch that mouse quickly. So hopefully there's no ice in there and the fox gets his meal, or if you're voting for the mouse, hopefully there is a layer of ice in there and the fox doesn't get his meal, but that is a very common food source for the red fox. Another animal who doesn't need to pounce through snow to eat a mouse would be the ermine or the short-tailed weasel. Now these guys are one of my favorites. Now you see in that brown one, that's the same animal. That's his summer coat. This time of year, that summer coat changes to a white coat. And what he's doing is he starts to get white splotches on different sides. He's kind of symmetrical though, it's, it's even. And it slowly over time changes to completely white. But why doesn't he just go straight white? Well, one, he may end up with a bald spot in the process. But two, think about the season. Do we get one solid snow and it stays snowy all year? No. So if he went completely white, as soon as the weather, as soon as the daylight changed, he'd be too exposed against the dark leaves. So they slowly change white over time. Now you'll notice on the tail there, there's a little bit of black on the tip. So you can see that on the short tailed weasel. And in the bottom picture, you see he's crawling under a rock. That's to let us know that they can crawl in tunnels. So that white footed mouse there, yeah, he's got to watch out <laughs> for the ermine because he's going to go through those tunnels hunting mice because he's long and skinny and can attack that mouse, no problem. Now a fun fact that actually made me really like weasels is he has a long body, right? So think about that, he could lose a lot of body heat through that length, right? His fur is fairly thick, but a little thin. So sometimes he makes a little burrow and he does not waste the fur of his prey. He uses the fur to help insulate his burrow and stay warm. He does not make waste of anything that he's eating, apparently. <laughs> a little fun fact there about uh, the ermine or the short-tailed weasels, their other name. Now, other animals can change color too. Um, in Maine, we have the snowshoe hare. So um, cottontails are generally uh, more of a southern species, the eastern cottontail, um, New England cottontail. You can get them going through up a little bit of Maine, but they're more of southern Maine. But the snowshoe hare is more widely spread and they tend to have a little bit longer feet because, again, they're dealing with more things. So they have pretty long ears and a longer face, and they change to white in the wintertime. Um, and these little bunnies will hop around on top of the snow because generally the snow is not really thick enough for them to burrow. Um, in some places they can do that, but they go around and as the snow gets thicker, it actually raises them up higher to reach more food. So when winter first comes, they can only get to what they can reach. Maybe they stand on their back legs, right? And they're chewing on bark, they're chewing on buds and new growth off of branches. But as the snow gets thicker, they can actually reach more branches and get more food um, to eat. So it's a pretty good, pretty good way to live. But, you know, it's an herbivore. It's a pretty big herbivore for, for some predators. So again, foxes and coyotes will also be hunting these. Um, and also the bobcat. Um, bobcats are amazing animals. Um, they're, they're polka dotted kind of look almost, right? Um, kind of blends right in with the rest of their fur, creating this nice camouflaged look with those spots. And um, they easily can be mistaken at first glance with lynx. Now lynx are often more often a northern species and they're, they're, they're really good at living in snow. They have lots of big, big furry paws. But the bobcat here, they can, they can blend in with their forest environment, walk through a good amount of snow and hunt things like, like um, snowshoe hares, uh, squirrels, um, different animals like that. And uh, if you look in the top left picture there, that picture of the bobcats kind of blending in with the shadows, right? pretty good at camouflage. Now these are direct photos, big close-ups. If we had them zoomed way out, even that one in the top where he's down hunched in the grass would be a little trickier to find. They really rely on their stealth because they're cats. 
you know, they are related to lions. We've all seen how lions hunt, there may be some kind of National Geographic Planet Earth special, right? They crouch, they sneak, and they, and they pounce and they hunt. Your house cat does the same thing with the toys or maybe your foot if you're that lucky. <laughs> um, but they, they're stealthy, stealthy hunters. Now, other animals that we find this time of year um, would be white-tailed deer. And white-tailed deer, um, they kind of change their fur color. Um, so on the right here, we have a uh, doe with an older fawn behind her, and they're very reddish in color. But as the season goes on, they need to get a warm fur coat. And so they start to shed their, their fall coat, and they start to get more of a gray fur coat, kind of like the, the, the buck there on the left. And so the, the nice, dense um, uh, gray fur is going to keep them really warm. And um, this time of year, as so you might be aware, the buck are looking for the does um, to mate. Um, and that's why the buck have their antlers. They, uh, you know, I know we always say no fighting, fighting's not nice, but in wildlife, they do fight because that's how you, you determine who's the stronger animal, who's the animal that's going to get the rights to uh, have, have babies with that doe, um, kind of have that mating process. So that's what the antlers are for. And antlers are actually made of bone. Um, they have really strong um, neck muscles to help support when they headbutt each other. They're, they're fighting, those antlers are walking right in and they're pushing into each other and the, the stronger buck will, will win and be able to, to keep its territory and, and mate with the does that are nearby. Um, but they're heavy. Bone is heavy, right? And so in the winter time, they'll start to fall off. And some people like to collect them when they find them, but the antlers that stay on the ground don't go to waste. They are actually vitamins for the animals that live in the forest. They're full of calcium, right? Nature likes to recycle. So things like those little, that little deer mouse I mentioned, or the squirrels, those poor guys that were getting preyed upon earlier in the conversation, they get to eat the antlers. They'll chew on them. Sometimes you can find antlers um, in the forest with chew marks on them. Looks like someone scraped uh, fingers through soft clay. And what they're doing is they're getting the vitamins out of them. You'll even find foxes and coyotes will chew on them. Uh, because again, it's vitamins. People, anim animals need vitamins just like people do. Now, in the winter time, deer, like our moose, um, they like to eat different food. Their diet actually changes. Their stomach goes from being able to eat soft vegetation like leafy greens and, you know, for the moose, those aquatic plants, to eating browse, which is the the woody material, right? That stuff that's that's kind of you kind of go on the ends of branches and sometimes you see new growth and buds and things, right? Those are things that they're looking to eat. So habitat changes this time of year for these animals. They sometimes move away from where there's a lot of soft plants and fields or at wetlands and they go more into the, the forest where they can find maybe young and small plants that they can eat the branches of. But moose are actually even better designed for snow than deer. They both have pretty long legs to walk through the snow, right? They can go around and they can pick up their legs and walk around and reach the branches with their long necks. And deer will, will find places when it gets really deep and they'll stay underneath maybe more conifer trees, evergreen trees, where the snow maybe hasn't quite built up so much. It's not maybe several feet, it's only a couple of feet deep. But a moose, they live further north, right? We get some down here, but they live further north typically. You can get them throughout Maine, but they're designed for their shoulder rather than being your typical ball socket joint, they actually can slide their shoulder blade. They can slide up and down in their shoulders. So they can actually pick their legs up higher than a deer and be able to walk through deeper snow. So here we have a couple pictures of moose. We have a, um, a cow and her calf. Of course, that's of course a summer or a, a, a late summer, early fall picture. And uh, you know, she doesn't have antlers. The males, of course, have these massive antlers that are pomaded. That means they have that big, wide, flat section as well as points. And again, the male moose have those for the same reason as the white-tailed deer for fighting the other male moose. And uh, they will start to fall off. And, you know, as we go into winter here, they'll start to lose their, their antlers because they don't have that hormone anymore. They have a hormone that tells them it's time to grow antlers. And then as we go into winter, that hormone goes away and nobody wants to carry heavy antlers anymore. The antlers are very heavy, many, 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 many pounds. All right, here's another iconic animal for me and the porcupine. 
Um, you know, you may see them sometimes in the tops of tree branches, right? The porcupines, they're sitting up there uh, sleeping. They tend to be more active at night. And uh, they look like a big blob up on the ends of tree branches, especially sometimes around like hemlock trees tend to be some of their favorite tree branches to take naps in. But as the weather gets colder, they don't spend as much time in the trees. Imagine that, it's kind of cold and windy up there. <laughs> they don't want to be up there. And uh, they come down and they go into burrows and they sleep a lot. They don't hibernate, but they sleep a lot. Kind of things that we might want to do in the winter, but we're not allowed to because we got to like work and stuff, maybe go to school. Um, but they will come out periodically and they're herbivores. You can see in that close up picture of those orange teeth. It does, they're not bad at like keeping their teeth clean. Their teeth are actually orange because that's iron. Iron is strong, right? We build things with iron. And so that iron on the front of their teeth keeps their teeth from breaking as they chew on branches and, and they eat the bark off of branches. So they like to climb out on things like, you know, different, different plants, hemlock, um, and they cut them down. Sometimes if you're hiking in the winter, you can notice it more than in the summer. You could be hiking along a trail and all of a sudden you see all these branches <laughs> scattered around this tree. Well, stop and take a look for a minute. See if you see any little tiny porcupine poops, right? They're scat. And um, sometimes there's a little bit of a musky smell too. You might be running into a porcupine's habitat. And you also might notice some small quills. If you have small children, be careful because they can still poke you a little bit, but it's fun to pick them up and you know look at the quills if you're careful. Um, porcupine actually about 30 thousand quills on their body. That's a lot. Um, and not a single one of them can shoot. They do not shoot off of the porcupine's body. An animal has to have a run in with it. And the porcupine will, um, you know, they have barbs on the animals like a fish hook, so it embeds in the animal's skin. So an animal really doesn't want to get hit by these. Um, so there's not a lot of predators of porcupines. Um, except this guy, <laughs> the fisher, which they, they are on um, Sears Island as well. Fishers, um, they can have a pretty bad reputation. Um, they're seen as being pretty tough. They can take down pretty big prey. I mean, a fisher and a, a porcupine, that's, that's, that's pretty close in size. Um, but a fisher knows that if you get a porcupine on its back, the belly is a lot easier to attack without the quills. <laughs> so they know to get a porcupine upside down and then they can eat them. So they're one of the main predators um, of the porcupine. And uh, fishers do like a lot of dense conifer evergreen forests, um, but they can also be found in deciduous forests, so your oak and your maple. So you definitely can find them out around Sears Island. Um, you can see a pair there. Um, seeking their heads out of a tree and um, <clears throat> they actually den or sometimes sleep in trees. So that's actually, those are actually two young kits from a spring photo. Um, this time of year, they're more loners. You don't really find fishers in groups. Um, they can climb trees. You can tell by those nice big claws. They're good tree climbers. Um, they're often more nocturnal than uh, found during the day or diurnal. Um, they have pretty good sense of smell, a nice thick fur coat. Um, and they don't fish. Um, so Fisher is actually just a name that they got. It was a misnomer from calling them Vishers, which are the pole cats over in Russia. And then they became Fisher cats. And now we just call them Fishers. So it's a little confusing name, but they are a carnivorous weasel. Um, you know, they're like two to three feet in length. They're, um, you can find them around. They eat small mammals. So, you know, if you do have a habitat that supports them, you do want to be mindful maybe of, you know, if you have an outdoor cat, maybe keep them indoors You have a small dog, maybe bring them out on leash because this guy can't tell, you can tell the difference between a wild mammal and a pet. They're just looking for food. So, then there's this tiny cute little weasel, right? This adorable weasel is don't let a size fool you. So they're not very big. This is a mink. They are excellent swimmers. Uh, you can find them along rivers. You can find them along coastline. They've actually been found um, kind of swimming to islands as well that are a little bit off the coast. And so they're, they're not afraid of much. Weasels are kind of like that. Most weasels um, can take something down up to three times their own body size. So they're pretty tough. Now, a weasel is most famous, um, a mink is most famous for eating fish. 
they can drag some pretty hefty fish out of the water by their head and uh, bring them on shore and eat them. Um, they'll eat small mammals, so they will go after deer mice and moles and voles um, that are found along the, the forest and the edge of the, the wetland area where they live. Um, but these animals, they'll go in and out of the water as long as it's not frozen solid. And even when it is, they sometimes find um, areas where it's, uh, you know, it's easy to break or they maintain a little hole. Maybe they find an otter hole or a beaver hole or they stay more, co and if they're lucky, they're in a coastal area that doesn't freeze a whole lot. But that fur coat that you see, especially in the close up of the photo, you can see it's kind of water repellent. And so they actually don't get wet at the base of their fur. They actually stay pretty dry. That top layer is kind of oily and, and the water rolls off of it. And then they have a lot of thick, nice warm fur underneath. So that's our mink. Another animal that if you go out, especially you know, if you want to see some of these animals like early morning, especially this time of year as the sun's coming up, these are, those are all really good time of uh, day to go out and see these things. Um, if the tide's down low, you know, kind of walking along the coastline, you might find you might find a mink coming out, uh, going in or coming out of the water looking for its food. But all of these animals couldn't exist without habitat, right? There are a lot of really important um, pockets of habitat around Maine, and we're really lucky that Maine has these wonderful uh, wild resources. There's all sorts of um, wildlife that live in these places. There's all sorts of fish and um, you'll find wetlands, you'll find forests, you'll find fields, um, lots of really, really cool places. And without places, you know, landowners protect uh, big chunks of land from development. Um, groups like the Friends of Sears Island help protect these places. Um, even programs that come from places like the Belfast Free Library, you're educating people about the importance of wild places. Um, so protecting places is something that, that is really important. It gives us all places to go hiking. It gives us all places to enjoy wildlife. It gives wildlife a place to be, to raise their babies, to find food, to survive the winter. Um, and so there's all different kinds of uh, reasons and what, that we like to protect wildlife. And if you're like me, you want to be able to help protect wildlife. And there's a lot of different ways that you can, right? Um, to help conserve and protect wildlife in Maine, um, you could support organizations like the Friends of Sears Island, um, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. You can support in a, a, a bunch of different ways. Um, if you know a birder, a really great gift for a birder would be the birder band. Um, the birder band, you can actually, it comes with a personalized number on it that you register to your name and phone number and you can put it on your binoculars. And if someone finds it, they can recall the number on the band and report it back to, to, the, to the department and we can get the binoculars back to the owner. So all that, that money goes to help support bird conservation, different license plates to support different kinds of um, uh, areas in your need. You know, today is Giving Tuesday, so supporting all different organizations, whether you want to support education or conservation. I know we don't want to think about tax season coming up, but the chickadee checkoff is something that you can do on your taxes to help support um, wildlife conservation as well. So lots of uh, different things that you can do there. So here we have this last little guy. This is our ermine again, poking his head up under this from the snow. And I forgot to mention that layer of snow is called the subnivian zone. And it's actually a really cool, cool layer to help protect wildlife. So I wanted to leave time for questions and see what people have to uh, say. Um, you could keep going all day long here talking about wildlife and I'd like to see um, if you guys have any questions, there's a lot of wildlife that we find out here in Maine. There's all sorts of, uh, like I said, big wildlife, small wildlife. So if you have questions about them, maybe you've seen something, maybe you're curious about something, please write them in the chat. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have a question here that just came in on chat. Do we have gray fox in mid-coast Maine? Yeah, so we do get gray fox. Gray fox are about the same size as red fox, a little smaller, 
And they have, instead of that nice reddish coat or orangey coat, they actually have a salt and pepper kind of look to their, their fur coat. And red foxes like to climb around, I mean, not to climb around, they like to be in the fields and the forest, whereas the gray foxes like to climb in trees a lot more. They're a little bit more nimble like that. So like if you've ever been to the wildlife park, sometimes people wonder where our gray fox is. He's often up in, in the trees and in his enclosure kind of kind of sleeping or hiding. But yeah, you can find uh, gray foxes around here. Um, okay, hang on. Um, I have another question from Barbara. She says, do all mammals produce about equal amounts of female and male offspring? Hmm. So it's very similar. I don't know if you remember your genetics classes or high school science classes, um, but you know, that's all different, uh, different by chance. Um, I'm not sure if every species, maybe some species might have more specific ways, but again, it comes down to those X and Y chromosomes dividing up the right way to give you a male or a female. So, you know, if you did that whole, what is it, the, the square, your genetic square and kind of figure out your chances, um, it can be, uh, it can vary. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Dorothy, does moose hunting hurt the species? So hunting in the state is actually very much uh, regulated and monitored. Our, we have biologists that specialize as well as biologists that um, cover specific regions. And there's very important biological data covered through hunting as well as non-hunting methods of surveying the animals to um, keep track of how the populations are doing and set the bag and set the limits every year for how many of a species can be hunted um, and the methods that they're allowed to hunt. So it's, it's very closely monitored and watched. And actually a lot of um, hunting can actually keep from having too many of uh, an animal in one area. I, um, I recently, not too long ago, lived down in Rhode Island and they have a lot of deer there. There's a lot of people and a lot of deer that live close together. And when you get a lot of, you get a lot of too many of one animal, sometimes they can starve because there's not enough food or not enough space. Um, so hunting kind of helps out the same way natural uh, predation does, like having coyotes and foxes, it can, uh, it can help, so. Yeah. Um, Terry has a question, she just, about her own backyard. She says, she sees something the size of a gray square, squirrel or maybe a mink that is black. Any ideas what that animal is? So it's a weasel size and it's about the size of a squirrel. Now some squirrels can act like gray squirrels can actually be um, in what's a black phase. They're not common, but it can happen. Um, other animals, I mean, depending on where you live, if it's going across the ground, you could have um, a species of weasel um, like a mink. So um, yeah, I hope that helps. It's kind of hard to tell without seeing it. If you ever have a, a photo or, um, uh, maybe a little bit more of a description that would help, but yeah, it could be one of those two animals. Um, okay, great, thanks. So um, we had a question from Joel and he says, please talk about ticks and mammals. That's a whole program unto itself, I know, but brief, as briefly as you can. Yeah, we can take a minute to talk about that. I know ticks are an animal that we all really, you know, we think about, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of ticks out there. The one that people are usually most um, concerned about is the deer tick, which is the, uh, or the black-legged tick, which is the one that can carry the Lyme disease. There are other species of tick in Maine. Um, some carry a few other different um, viruses, but the, um, the ticks like to travel on mammals. So we all know deer are very famous for carrying them, but other animals can as well. Um, you can get rabbits that carry them, mice can carry them, and sometimes different different species will carry a different stage of the tick's life cycle. So if you can remember life cycles, you know, like butterflies, caterpillar, right, chrysalis, butterfly, right? That's a very simple one. Tick also, ticks also go through a little bit of a life cycle where they have the egg, then there we got like the, the smaller like larval stages all the way up to adult, and then different stages sometimes like to live on different animals. Um, so what ways you can help avoid that is just always doing a, really just always do a tick check after you're done hiking. And if we get a really big cold spell before we get a lot of snow, sometimes that can help uh, limit the number of ticks in an area. But 
They also like living underneath the snow. The snow gets really thick. It helps to keep them protected from the cold. Okay, so thank you. Um, let's see, we have, I'm just trying to catch up on the questions here. Yeah. Um, do red squirrels have different rooms where they live like chipmunks? Yeah, so red squirrels and gray squirrels, although they have different methods for hiding their food, um, they actually both don't live in burrows. They don't live underground like chipmunks in the winter time. Gray squirrel, squirrels will, um, they generally live inside hollows and crevices of trees in the winter time. Uh, in the summer, sometimes we'll see what we call drays or squirrel nests down on the ends of branches or in, in um, you know, big sections of branches that they'll make out of by pushing a bunch of leaves and sticks together. And those are more their, their summer nests. Um, but they tend to live inside um, hollow trees and places like that. Okay. Um, Roberta has a question. Uh, what might we find while walking at Sears Island this time of year? I know you yeah. mentioned some, but continue. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot. So a lot of these animals you can find there. We made sure to stick to, now some might be less likely, you know, everyone wants to see the moose. <laughs> Generally those, you gotta go a little bit further, you know, kind of west and north to see some real, some, some more guaranteed populations, but that can really vary depending on how the season is with drought and things. So that one might be harder to see there, but deer, rabbits, squirrels, uh, weasels, um, foxes, you know, a lot of those animals. And especially if you go walking, um, kind of earlier in the morning or later in the evening before sunset. Um, those are the times that animals tend to be more active. Anywhere. You know, but a social Shape where you're in wildlife. That question there um, to help out about that. So, um, um, so I, someone asked how, how climate change is affecting the animals. Yeah, so that's a really tough one. Um, there's a, a lot of work still being done to understand, but in some of the ways that we can understand, especially based off of things we talked about tonight, um, if you think about things like animals like the ermine, uh, the snowshoe hare, animals that change their color, their fur color to better adapt for camouflage in the winter time, they're not changing their fur color based off of temperature. They're not based, doing it based off of the amount of snow that falls. They are actually changing their fur color based off of the photo period and the amount of sunlight. So as the weather changes and maybe our seasons shift a little bit, maybe we don't get as much winter, we don't get as much snow, they're still gonna change to white, um, regardless of the fact that we don't have the same amount of snow. And so, or maybe we'll get snow later in the season when um, the light's starting to come back and they're starting to change to brown. So by these seasons and the photo periods, the amount of sunlight getting kind of out of sync that could cause animals potentially, not guaranteed, but it's a potential that it could cause problems for these animals that change colors um, in the winter time. So that's that's one way. There are, you know, a few other things, you know, just the same as, you know, when you get a, a change in a population, you know, sometimes there can be different things as diseases or viruses. But again, these are things that are still being studied, but um, the fur color definitely, it has a chance of being a problem in the future. <clears throat> All right. All right. So, um, I, I, sorry, I, there is one more question. I, I can see okay. it, Brenda. Um, okay. somebody, somebody asked a question about possums and whether they live sort of in the Penobscot County, Hancock area and where they live in Maine, whether it's possible to see, see those. They have a wildlife camera um, and they get a lot of different mammals, but they're not seeing possums and they're curious about that. Yeah, possums are still making their way up in Maine. Possums are actually an animal that over the past several decades have been moving further north. Um, possums started as more of a southern um, U.S. species and they've been slowly making their way further and further north. In fact, they're actually not 
super well designed for really cold periods. In fact, sometimes uh, you'll find possums that are, are kind of missing pieces in their ears and that's from frostbite. And so these animals have just been slowly making their way further north. Um, you know, the climate has, you know, does shift kind of over time. You know, we all know climate change is happening as well, but things do shift. And so animals do sometimes change their, um, where their distribution is. I'm not sure about in that, that county, in that area of what the population is doing there. I do remember recently speaking with our, um, one of our wildlife biologists about this. And she kind of said the same thing to me. And she said, you know, we're not really sure exactly where they are. They're kind of moving. They're not super widespread in Maine at this point in time. But, um, you know, we, we do have them. They're definitely more common in Southern Maine. Um, but, you know, they are, they are moving around and you can find them sometimes. It's not very common right now. All right, we have one more question. Um, someone is asking, what nature activity do you recommend, um, you know, sort of based on for a wildlife activity for kids in the five to 10 age range? Yeah, there are actually a lot of really fun activities to do um, with kids. I'm actually going to, real quick here, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna share my screen one more time to show you something and I'll put the link in the chat as well. But if you go to our webpage, we've been working on updating our education page. I'm glad you asked. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and um, so here's our homepage. If you haven't seen our homepage before, if you go to programs and resources, go to educational programs, it'll bring you to this wonderful page, um, safety courses and other things for teachers and educators as well. But for at-home learning, click on this page, it's going to bring you to these wonderful different activity pages. There's things that you can do outside. Um, there's different activities you could do in the home, uh, all different activities here that you can just down that you can just download, as well as going to um, our YouTube channel and you could watch a couple different um, videos that we've done uh, at the Maine Wildlife Park this past year. Um, about Maine's wildlife, and sometimes you get to see the moose. I really recommend watching the moose one. That one's really cool. <laughs> the moose just pop right up in it. But I'll, um, I'll put the link to this specific page um, in the chat, and um, I highly recommend checking it out because some, some of the really fun things to do with kids is just be out there and make it... Um, you know, make it something that they really want to do. So don't make it a chore, make it something fun, make a plan. If your kids are not sure about going outside, maybe start with, you know, half an hour or something, um, especially with different weather, making sure we're all dressed appropriately for the weather. And then I found some people have really good success by saying, after we go outside and we come back in, we'll read a book together, you know, kind of making goals. But when you're outside, um, some of my favorite activities is, um, one of them is making a sit spot. And so you just need a spot as their spot in the yard and they get to make observations while they're there. Another one is sound mapping. So like when you go hiking, sometimes pausing on the trail and kind of just closing your eyes and understanding that different senses will help with different things and ask them to point in a direction when they hear something or better yet, a small notebook or something where you can kind of put a dot in the middle of the page and then draw things around you where you think you hear them, birds or squirrels or a tree branch or a car, right? And so um, there's a lot of really neat activities on that page I shared. Um, very fun things to check out. All right, um, so Laura, I don't know if you mind taking one more question. Oh, um, and I will add, someone just reminded me uh, in the chat uh, that we are Friends of Sears Island. We have um, some kits each month that have things that you can do at home to get kids outside um, and some activities sort of like what you were talking about. So I encourage people to also check the website and we, we have limited quantities of them, but they're free when you sign up each month. So. If you're looking for activities for kids by ages five to 10, um, that's sort of the exact uh, audience and age group that we're targeting with that program as well. So that's just another resource that's out there. Yeah, that's um, really great. Yeah, and so the last question we're gonna take tonight um, says, do you see moose migrating further north with climate change? Um, I feel the hotter summers are affecting the amount moose eat and then having less body fat causing higher mortality. 
Yeah, that is an area that um, I probably can't speak too much to. I mean, in general, animals do sometimes shift a little. One of the things with climate change is it's happening so quickly that some animals might not respond as fast. Um, so I'm not really sure. I wish I could give you a better answer on that um, as to how exactly climate change will affect moose. There's obviously going to be some kind of effect. They're much more of a, a colder weather um, animal. You know, we don't find them too far south. We'll occasionally get a few strays that go into parts of Massachusetts and Connecticut. There are small populations down there. Um, but again, more of the population is north, but that is also a different habitat as well. It's not really just temperature. Um, so I wish I could give you more of an answer on that, but I'm not sure. Um, but real quick, I'm sorry, I know there are a lot of really wonderful people on here, but I have one really nice special friend um, on here, Adelaide, Addie. I just want to say hi to you right there. I don't know if she's listening. Hi, Addie. Um, uh, she is a very interested in wildlife, and I'm very glad that she has joined us tonight. All right, well, thank you so much, Laura, for um, being with us tonight. That was excellent and really informative. Appreciate yeah. you taking the time. Yeah, thank you thank so you. very much for having me. And um, I think it's really great. If anyone has any other questions, uh, feel free to uh, hook them up with being able to contact me. I'd love to be able to help answer further questions going forward, or you can just reach us um, online through our info center as well. All right, and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight as well. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.